Hello everyone, I'm Matthew, I'm the lead pastor here at Cedar Ridge. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Today we're going to wrap up our series called On the Trail with Jesus. Uh, you may remember that for the last few weeks we've been virtually hiking the Jesus Trail, uh, which is uh, in, runs from Nazareth to uh, Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Um, a real present day hiking trail in uh, the Galilee region of North, Northern Israel. And we've been um, looking at various landmarks along the way and really trying to soak up the culture and uh, history and geography of the region to bring the stories about Jesus and Jesus' teaching alive. Um, last week, Ruth took us as far as the Sea of Galilee. In fact, she took us down to the small town of Magdala, which is on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. So today we're gonna to pick up the trail there. We're going to um, spend a bit of time on the shore, um, uh, just thinking and imagining some things about the Sea of Galilee in Jesus' time. And then we're going to trek along the northwest shoreline towards Capernaum, where the trail ends and our, our, our journey will end. I think you can see from this map that um, the Sea of Galilee is really the dominant landmark in the Galilee region in, in many respects. Um, uh, from the time of antiquity until today, it's been a hive of activity, mainly agriculture and, and fishing, um, but it's also actually not a sea, it's a freshwater lake. Um, so it's also been a, a major source of drinking water for the populations over the years. Um, and in present day Israel, it supplies 50% of the population with their, with their water supply. So a very significant lake. Um, as I was mentioning, it's a, it's a freshwater lake. It's in fact the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It's 700 feet below sea level. Um, and I think this, um, this picture here gives you a sense of uh, just how low it is uh, compared to the, the terrain around it. It's, it's set in the Jordan Rift Valley, so it's between the African and Arabian tectonic plates. That means there's historically been a lot of volcanic activity there, which has shaped the landscape. Um, but also it's prone to earthquakes, and you may remember there was an earthquake in the uh, story about Jesus at the resurrection. Um, it's uh, not only the lowest freshwater lake, it's the second lowest lake of any kind in the world. And the, the, the one that's lower than it is the Dead Sea, uh, which is a saltwater lake. And that's um, a little bit further south in the Rift Valley. You can't actually see it here on this picture. Um, it's fed by underground springs, but mainly by the Jordan River uh, flowing into it at the north and then flowing out of it at the south. Um, and it's about 200 feet deep in part, so it's you know, rich fishing territory. Um, it's about eight miles wide and 30 miles long, and that means it has a circumference of something like 33 miles, which means there's plenty of room for natural harbors and uh, for small towns to have developed. And so this was a bustling kind of area uh, during the time of Jesus with lots of fishing villages and uh, commercial villages springing up all around the lake. Um, much of the sea's beauty or the lake's beauty is because of its uh, the fact that it's set so low and it's, it's um, bordered on the west by Mount Arbel, as we were um, hearing about and looking at last week, um, and in the east um, by the Golan, uh, you know, two very highly elevated areas. And that means we get this, these wonderful vistas, beautiful views. You can see here, um, this is a view from the west looking out to the Golan in the, uh, in the distance. You can just imagine those cliffs um, in the story of Jesus, where Jesus crosses the lake to that region and casts out um, demons, and those demons go into the pigs, and the pigs run down the, the run down the cliffs. You can almost imagine that just looking at at this picture. Um, but it also means that during the lush green spring times, you have these beautiful uh, contrasts between the green and the blue of the sea, and then in the dry season, um, perhaps equally beautiful contrasts of the of the brown dry land with, again, the deep blue um, sea of, of the Sea of Galilee. Um, so just a really beautiful picturesque area as well. In the Gospels, um, the lake is called um, by various names. Sometimes it's called the Lake of Tiberias. That's generally how the Gospel of John refers to it, uh, because Tiberias was the main city, a Roman city named after the Emperor Tiberius uh, on the western shore. Um, sometimes it's just called the lake. Uh, the Gospel of Luke calls it the Lake of Gennesaret. And in the, um, in the Hebrew scriptures, it's called the Sea of Kinnereth. Um, but, you know, it, it's generally called the Sea of Galilee. And many of Jesus's activities centered around uh, different parts of the Sea of Galilee. He, he was immersed in the fishing culture. He called his first disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They were, they were fishermen. Um, and he uh, spent time on the lake. Uh, sometimes they would 
push a boat out to uh, just give Jesus a little bit more room so he could project to the, to the crowds. Uh, he would cross the lake to, to move around the area uh, via boat. Um, he was, uh, many of his miracles happened around here um, in, the, in the towns and villages, the calming of the storm on the lake, obviously, and Jesus walking on water. Um, and many of his, uh, his um, allusions, his metaphors, his parables, his stories were drawn from uh, the, the fishing culture that he, uh, he was so um, humanly present in and to. Um, we'll touch on some of those stories today as we, as we move around the shore as well. Um, the lake struggled a little bit in recent times. So, um, you know, all kinds of reasons, uh, global warming, drought, um, pollution, uh, a lot of competition for the natural resource of fresh water. Um, so, uh, you know, the different countries in that region as part of the um, Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, have at various times created a, a situation where the water level has gone down quite low. Um, here's a picture from, um, this is sort of mid 2000s, so about 10 years or so ago. And uh, you can see it's got um, quite low there. Fortunately, it's recovered more recently. Um, there's a dam at the southern end in, in Degania. Uh, where is a picture of that dam here? It's just a small one, um, you'll, and uh, they've been able to control the water level a little more, and it's it's back up to much healthier levels now. Um, but um, the the um, low water levels actually have resulted in some interesting discoveries. Um, let's just I'm, I'm going to show you one of those now. Let's just get back on the trail though. You'll see here we're going to take a slight detour as we go around the lake to um, to the uh, kibbutz of Ginnasar. Um, and, and there was an interesting discovery there um, back in the 80s where uh, two brothers from that kibbutz, um, both of whom were um, sort of budding amateur archaeologists, went out onto the shore uh, uh, when the water level was really low and they discovered this boat, which has, um, it's, it's known as colloquially as the Jesus boat. No historical connection to Jesus that we can prove. Um, it's really, I mean, its official name is the Ancient Galilee Boat, but it's definitely a first century fishing boat. Um, and it's been uh, restored and put in a museum here and um, in, in, in this area. And uh, you can visit it today, um, a slight detour from the Jesus Trail. Uh, here's an artist's impression of what that boat probably would have looked like when it was functional back in the first century. Again, it's just an artist's in, impression. There's no specific connection to Jesus, but um, the assumption is that Jesus would have traveled in a boat like this. Um, and certainly his, his earliest followers who were fishermen would have fished in boats like this and, and traveled around in boats like this. So um, even though there's no direct connection, it I think helps our imagination as we think about the kind of life that Jesus was living back then and the kind of way he moved around. And, um, you know, let, let's look at a scripture that maybe we can read a little bit more imaginatively with that in mind. Um, this is from the very first chapter of Mark where he actually calls his first disciples. Uh, Mark chapter 1 says the following, after John was put in prison, that's John the Baptist, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. But when he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So we see here, uh, you know, Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, on those shorelines, calling his followers. Um, and then they all proceeded to Capernaum, which is the, the journey that we're on, to, 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 on today. And we'll, we'll get there um, before too, too long. Um, fishing, incidentally, is a still an important part of the uh, commercial life on the Sea of Galilee. Um, one of the most common fish caught is uh, tilapia. And it's actually become known as St. Peter's fish because of the obvious connections. Um, and this is how most of them end up. Um, on a plate. So, uh, but let's let's get back to the trail. Um, so here's an aerial view of where we're going to be going. You can, we're going to start heading around the northwest shore to um, the small town of Tabka. 
um, and then we'll move along to Capernaum. You could also see the Mount of Beatitudes here. That's a detour, minor detour off the trail. Um, uh, we're not going to go there today, but we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, which is, uh, you know, this is one of the um, proposed locations of that sermon um, of Jesus. Um, we'll talk about that next week. Um, and, and you can see also a little bit further around uh, to the east, you can see the town of Beth Bethsaida, which we're not going to get there today. Uh, we'll stop at Capernaum, but that's where um, Peter seems to have actually come from, Simon Peter. That was his hometown uh, before he went to Capernaum. Um, let's just look at the trail map again, just to orient ourselves. Uh, we're on our way now to Tabka. Tabka is this um, uh, small town on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. We're, here we are heading down into that town off the trail, um, and it has na a natural harbour there. Um, and its um, name is actually rooted in the Greek um, word for seven springs or Greek words for seven springs. It's been changed a lot over the years and it's now called Tabka. Um, but uh, there, we found six of those springs. There were seven. Just look, reading ancient documents, it seems there were seven. Six have been discovered. Um, and these ancient springs um, resulted in the proliferation of algae. Uh, which r attracted a lot of fish. So this is rich fishing territory. And um, there's a lot of evidence of uh, a lot of fishing going on here over thousands of years. Several Jesus stories have, been, of, have become traditionally associated with this area. Now, we, obviously, we don't know for sure. And there's a lot of um, projection, I think, uh, often when um, certain locations are associated with Jesus. But again, I think it can help stimulate our imagination. Um, traditionally, uh, this is viewed as the place that we just read about where the first disciples were called. Again, no real evidence for that. But I think if you look at this view um, from just on, on the lake back towards the shoreline, you can kind of imagine uh, perhaps uh, Jesus walking along there and, and calling out to people. Um, you'll notice in the picture that there's a, there's a building which obviously would not have been there back then. And that building is called the Church of the Multiplication because um, this is also um, uh, traditionally associated with the location of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Here's a, uh, uh, some more pictures of that church. That, this is a modern church built in uh, 19, uh, 1982. But um, the area was excavated in the 1930s and they found a, a Byzantine you know, mid third century structure and mosaic. Here's a, here's a picture of the mosaic um, underneath this church or well, they, they built the church on top of it. But when they when they discovered this, they they, they believed that historically this area was probably venerated as the location of uh, the multi multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Um, and there's some ancient documentation to suggest that it was associated with that. Again, no, no proof that it really was the location, but um, it certainly got that association. Um, there's another church there um, in, in Tabka, and this church is called the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. And that's because uh, this area is also associated with Jesus's final appearance in the Gospel of John after his resurrection to the disciples. That beautiful story in John 21 that we've looked at many times, so we're not going to look at it again today, uh, but where uh, Peter, having um, denied Jesus three times, is en encounters Jesus again on the beach and Jesus forgives him and asks him if he loves him three times. It's just a beautiful uh, story of restoration and reconciliation. Um, and uh, the, the Catholic tradition associates uh, that passage with Jesus um, giving a piece of full authority over the church. So the sort of it's the beginning of the people dynasty, if you like. Um, and so hence the church that's been built there to commemorate it is called the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. I think there's a certain irony in this, actually, because, um, again, going back to the, um, the fact that this is, a, this is rich fishing territory um, because of the, uh, the flora and fauna of the area. Um, the um, story in John 21 tells us that they'd, they'd gone back fishing, uh, the, the followers of Jesus, and uh, including Peter, and that they caught nothing, even in this really great fishing area. And then, of course, uh, Jesus says, oh, throw your nets on the other side of the boat, and they have this amazing catch of fish. So I think the story really is not so much about the primacy of Peter. I mean, I've got nothing against Peter at all, but really it's the primacy of the generosity, the love, the grace of God, the abundance of that, 
the, the abundance of love, acceptance and forgiveness. Um, so, uh, you know, may, maybe that we could build something else. So that's the, the um, church of the primacy of love or something like that. But, you know, there's a tradition that associating it with Peter. Um, so we're going to keep moving along. We're going to be coming to the end of our journey fairly soon. We're nearing uh, Capernaum, as you can see. Um, as I mentioned before, we're not today going to go to the Mount of Beatitudes. We'll do that next week. Um, but we'll, we'll arrive at the city or the town of Capernaum, which was known as the home of Jesus. Uh, we saw in that earlier scripture that Jesus goes with his disciples to Capernaum, seems to have made it his home. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about that in a moment when we read another scripture. Um, it's the most mentioned town in uh, the Christian scriptures um, apart from Jerusalem. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a prominent location in our tradition. Um, and um, Jesus taught in the synagogues there, we're told by the Gospels. Um, he performed all kinds of miracles there. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, I, I guess, the question, why did Jesus go to Capernaum? He leaves Nazareth. We, we, it seems Jesus leaves Nazareth because he was rejected there. Um, and also Nazareth was a, was a very small place. He goes to Capernaum, P Capernaum which is a little bigger, um, and also on uh, uh, the, what's known as the, the, the Via Maris, this um, ancient uh, trade route going from Egypt to Damascus in Syria, running north-south. So it would have been a, 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 you know, a somewhat cosmopolitan, um, busy kind of place, but not the most busy place on the Sea of Galilee or in the region. Um, Tiberius, a city I mentioned earlier, or town I mentioned earlier, would have been much bigger, much busier. Um, if Jesus was looking for influence and leverage, that would have been the place to go. Some people think the reason Jesus goes to Capernaum is because um, of, the, of the, the ruling Herods of, of that time. You may remember that the, the Roman um, imperial um, government has basically, in many of these locations, installed a puppet local government that they control, and in, in this area, uh, at this time, those were the Herods, Herod the Great, who, who had previous, you know, previously died um, when Jesus was, was um, very tiny, um, had uh, handed over a, a divided kingdom, if you like, to his sons. And um, the, the region of Galilee was ruled by Herod Antipas, who was a particularly nasty piece of work, to be honest. You can see on this map here how all the sort of um, uh, uh, government rulings are divided between the Herods. Um, Antipas was, was a fragile, insecure, narcissistic bully, really. He, was, he, he persecuted the followers of Jesus. He, it was he who was responsible uh, for the imprisonment and then beheading of John the Baptist. Um, so there was good reason why Jesus would want to get away from that. Um, he doesn't leave the region entirely by being in Capernaum. You can see on this map in the, um, the Sea of Galilee there in the top middle uh, with Capernaum, very close to the other region, the Golan, which is governed by um, Antipas's brother, Philip II. And he was way less um, of a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. Um, so some people think that Jesus deliberately moved closer to the boundary so that he could, when necessary, um, slip across the Jordan River into the Golan. And we know for sure that Jesus um, crossed the Sea of Galilee multiple times, it seems, um, crossed the Jordan multiple times. And we know from other stories about Jesus that he was actually quite careful. He wasn't um, reckless um, in going to Jerusalem, for instance. He was careful and when he planned those. He was, he, he, there were times when he tried to keep quiet and fly under the radar. He would sort of withdraw to the hills. Um, or he would tell people not to talk about the miracles and that kind of thing. So Jesus was obviously very strategic, and it may well be that's why he moved here, um, to um, move to an area of significance, but one where he could also be relatively safe um, until he chose to take more risks, which he obviously did. Um, here's the present-day town of Capernaum, uh, just a, an aerial shot here. And you'll see that it's a small archaeological site now, really. Um, it was uh, discovered um, in, in 1838 by an American explorer, Edward Robinson. Um, and he found remains of uh, what he eventually worked out was a, um, a synagogue. Didn't necessarily associate it with the town of Capernaum at the time. Uh, but that, it was later that century identified with Capernaum. And then it, the land was bought up by... Um, Catholics and, and is shared with, uh, with, the, with Greek, the Greek Orthodox Church. You can see two, uh, a Greek Orthodox and a Catholic Church in this, in this picture here. Um, lots more excavation happened and um, the, the synagogue was um, 
you know, uncovered. You can see here, this is a, um, the synagogue in Capernaum today. It's a fourth to fifth century one, one of the oldest in the world. Um, but interestingly, um, when they went, they dug a bit further, they realized it was built on top of another uh, synagogue believed to be from the first century. So this may well be the synagogue that Jesus uh, taught in, uh, preached in, uh, where Jesus uh, performed miracles. Um, again, we don't know that for sure, but um, there's reason to believe that. Um, and then a lot more excavation happened. You can see here they've uncovered um, houses or you know, the remnants of houses, which again date to the first century and, and, and pre-first century. Um, and you'll see in the background that there, there's a, a more modern building. That's another church, a, th a third of three churches uh, in Capernaum. And that church is, has been built around the remains of another ancient church. You'll see here um, uh, people looking on an octagonal 5th century church, um, which has been preserved. And uh, that church itself was built on top of what seems to be um, a, a, a particularly interesting first century house. Um, now, the reason it's interesting is because there's some evidence to suggest that this house, based on uh, apparent writing, graffiti on the walls, again, it's not, scholars don't all agree on this. Um, some, of the, some of the markings on the walls and some, of, some documents related to this house suggest it may have been venerated early on uh, um, post first century as uh, the house of Peter. So it's become known as the house of Peter. Again, we really don't have uh, confirmed evidence of that. Um, but um, what we can say is Jesus taught in synagogues like the one we just saw and even in houses like the one we just saw. So let's look at a story as we come to the end of this journey. Let's look at a story where Jesus is teaching in a house. Um, we just read from Mark chapter one. We're going to move on to Mark chapter two, where Jesus is in Capernaum. He's actually he seems to be based in Capernaum and then he'll withdraw sometimes on his own to um, to, you know, again, maybe avoid the authorities, maybe just to have some uh, time with God. Um, he also travels around in some of the nearby villages and towns, um, but always seems to come back to Capernaum. And you'll notice at the beginning of this passage that there's even a suggestion that he has a home there. Maybe he doesn't own it, but it's like his base. And the story seems to be set in that home. Here's what Mark chapter two says. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof and above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So let's just make a few um, brief observations about the story itself and then we'll make a couple of applications. Firstly, this is a story of resurrection. Um, it's a healing story, obviously, but the language used here is the language of burial and resurrection. The, the, the terms dug down and lowered the mat are the language of a Jewish funeral. Um, it's as though this man has been lowered into a grave. Um, and then uh, Jesus's words, get up, um, are, are exactly the same as the words for resurrection in the, in the Greek language. So um, there's a sort of foreshadowing here, perhaps, of Jesus's death and resurrection. But I think what we're being told here is that this is a story showing how Jesus brings powerful new life and a, and a new kind of life uh, to humanity, uh, which sort of leads on to our, our, our second point. This life is for everyone. Um, so Jesus is setting 
um, setting uh, God free from religion, if you like, or setting um, or reforming religion, at least, to show us that everyone can be connected to God. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to go to a priest uh, to be forgiven. Everyone can be forgiven freely, liberally. Jesus is bringing that notion out into the open, out onto the streets. And obviously it offends the, re the religious authorities. It's pretty scandalous. Um, he goes even further, though, I think, to say that humans have incredible power to forgive. Humans can forgive. And um, there's a key term here in the passage where Jesus says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That term, Son of Man, um, it's one of Jesus' favorite terms for himself. And it, it's very much associated in, in Hebrew apocalyptic um, scripture with um, the, a coming agent of God, um, uh, it became associated in, uh, by the time of Jesus with the coming of the Messiah. And it may be that Jesus uses that term from time to time in that kind of way. But there's, it can also be interpreted to mean simply human being. Um, um, you know, the son of man kind of is equivalent to, if you like, every mother's son or every father's daughter. It's a, a generic term for uh, uh, the human being. And Jesus is associating with humanity in this way by using this term. Um, and my sense is that's how Jesus is using it in this passage. Because if we look at the similar passage in or, or the same story in Matthew's gospel that occurs in Matthew chapter 9. In verse 8, right at the end of the story, it says, When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. Um, so there's a very human association with this story and what Jesus does. And of course, Jesus actually said he was empowering us to forgive one another um, when he appears to his disciples uh, towards the end of John's gospel he appears to them in a room before he appears to them by the sea um, in ch chapter 20 it says Jesus said to them peace be with you as the father has sent me so I send you when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained in other words Jesus is saying we as human beings have incredible power to forgive one another forgiveness isn't just a property of God it's a property of human beings and it's real forgiveness it's very very powerful this is again pretty radical stuff that Jesus is talking about another observation I think is that Jesus is saying human life is an integrated whole uh, you can't separate it out. We can't be separated from one another. We can't separate our spiritual lives, our, our, our physical lives. We, we are integrated wholes. Um, another interesting phrase in this passage, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sons are, sins are forgiven. Um, so the, the connection here is that it's not about the man's faith, it's the faith of his friends. They're, somehow their faith and their love for this paralyzed man and their support for him and their, their reaching out to him um, had an impact on the, on the man that went beyond just a little bit of help and support. It, it, it was a life transforming thing for him. We're so connected to one another, one another according to Jesus, that our faith, our love can, can make this kind of difference, this kind of impact on another human being. And then, of course, Jesus, um, you know, he's, he doesn't separate out the man's spiritual needs or his physical needs. Um, he sees those as inseparable. Um, to prove, if you like, that um, his sins are forgiven, he says, get up and walk. And, uh, you, you know, that, I, I don't think Jesus is thereby saying, uh, you know, if we're sick or if, if we're in difficult physical circumstances, if we're suffering, that means that there must be something wrong. We've done something wrong and God is repaying us. Uh, th there was a, a train of belief in that kind of theology that Jesus was challenging all the time. I don't think Jesus is saying that at all in this in this um, story. But I think we, we can all relate to the fact that we all experience guilt and fear and shame. Uh, we all experience that sense of low self-esteem and low self-worth. Um, and we carry that around in our bodies. It can actually be paralyzing of us. Um, that's something I've experienced myself. I've done things that I am ashamed of. I've experienced all kinds of guilt and shame and regret and fear and anxiety as a result of that. Uh, because basically I, I feel like uh, there's something wrong with me as a person. I mean, you can end up walking around with that kind of a feeling and it has a paralyzing effect on your life. Now I am over time working through that and, and experiencing forgiveness and, and letting go of that and forgiving myself is a process. 
Um, but I think probably we can all relate to that, that it, it has an impact even physically on us, certainly emotionally and psychologically. So I want to leave us with a couple of questions as we reflect on this story. And there's, um, there's more reflections in the, uh, the discussion questions this week. So download those. Um, and so you can dig a little bit deeper into this story. But I've got two questions from us, for us um, from the house in Capernaum, this uh, sort of house where Jesus, the real Jesus, is um, speaking to us as human beings. Um, firstly, in what ways could lack of self-forgiveness be paralyzing to us? I've just talked about that a little bit on a, on a personal level, but think of, about that for your own life. Um, where do you need to forgive yourself? If we have the power as human beings to forgive, and that forgiveness counts, where do we need to forgive ourselves? And in what way is that lack of forgiveness and that lack of self-worth and that lack of love for self paralyzing us? something to reflect on. And then secondly, in what ways could unforgiveness towards others be paralyzing us? Um, and when we think about our own lives, how, how, we, how often our own lack of self-love, our own lack of self-forgiveness uh, kind of works its way out in how we treat other people. We can, when people hurt us, we can hurt people back. Or when people won't forgive us, we are resentful back. And, and all kinds of, um, bad energy, if you like, builds up and, and it, it can be paralyzing of us. Um, I th again, I think we've all experienced this. And I think of what Ruth was sharing last week about what, what flows out of us, um, not when we're uh, intentionally being religious or not when we're on our guard, but when, when we're off guard and when people encounter us in everyday life, what flows out of us? Is it forgiveness and love and acceptance or is it resentment and fear, withdrawal, uh, competition? Um, how, how, what's, what's coming out of us and um, in what ways is that paralyzing us to be the kind of people that we're called to be, that Jesus believes we can be, agents of love, acceptance and forgiveness in this world who bring healing and reconciliation. So let's reflect on those two questions and as we approach communion now, um, let's be conscious that um, these two things, forgiveness of self and forgiveness of others, are very closely related. In fact, Jesus um, said in the Sermon on the Mount, um, which we'll look at next week, as I mentioned earlier, um, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their, uh, their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So in other words, um, two things are intimately connected. I don't think Jesus is saying this is tit for tat. You know, if you, if you don't forgive, then uh, you're going to get paid back with unforgiveness by God. I think, I think Jesus is just saying, you're either in the flow of forgiveness, living in the life of God that's freely given, or you're not. Imagine it like a river. You're either standing in a river and receiving forgiveness from upstream and then extending forgiveness downstream, or you're not standing in the river and you're not, you're not experiencing either. You can't, it's not, you can't have a foot in and a foot out. And um, so as we think about both of these, as we approach communion, let's put ourselves in the river. Let's just consciously decide we're going to forgive ourselves and we're going to extend forgiveness to those around us. Even people who hurt us, even people who don't forgive us, we're just going to let go and, and, and see ourselves come back to life. Um, remember that Jesus speaks to us and reaches to us as one who knew what pain was, who knew what rejection was. We saw in the first week of this journey when we began in Nazareth, how initially Jesus was, was uh, um, passionately and, and excitedly accepted and lauded by his hometown of Nazareth, but then rejected. And he goes to Capernaum at the end of this journey we've come to now. And initially, as we've just read, he was accepted and they were amazed at his teaching. Um, but we read later in the scriptures that he was eventually rejected at Capernaum as well. Um, and, and then um, rejected in Jerusalem, where he was eventually tried and executed. And so Jesus knows what this is like. And here's Jesus, one who was rejected, embodying forgiveness, extending forgiveness, and saying to us that we can join with him in um, bringing love, healing, and acceptance to other people. Um, and that's something we're going to celebrate now as we take communion together.